All right, guys, welcome to part two. We talked about history last video, and now I want to talk a little bit about just basic virology, basic viral structures, and uh, some of our resources, uh, specifically our textbook that we will be using. Viruses are just small infectious particles. Most people have heard of viruses, um, but I don't think most people actually grasp how small they are. So uh, I really like this picture a lot. It's from Pearson. Uh, they've got a typical red blood cell there, which you're gonna need a microscope to see anyway. There's an E. coli next to it, and then there's viruses next to it. So even smallpox is one of the larger viruses. There are a couple of viruses that can get really huge. Uh, on the next slide, I actually have a picture of those. Um, but for the most part, most of viruses are really, really, really small. Uh, when we talk about viruses, there's actually other terms that we use. So when we're talking viruses, we say virions. So when you're saying, oh, there's um, some kind of liquid with virions in it. So a virion is a loose term for a particle, a viral particle that may or may not be infectious. So something that we're going to learn is some viruses, uh, their progeny that they generate, some of those certain viruses make not a lot of viable offspring maybe 1% or 2% are actually infectious, but they do all those that 98% that's not infectious are still viral particles and we call those virions. So it just kind of depends on your virus. Some viruses, a lot of their virions are viable, some not so much, it just depends. So a virus has a DNA or RNA genome and it can be single-stranded or double-stranded for either of those normal animals like us, we have double-stranded DNA, right? That's what we normally have. Uh, and that's what most organisms have, but viruses are really, really weird. Um, they can have not double-stranded DNA. They have single-stranded DNA. They can have double-stranded RNA, which is very strange, or they can have positive or negative sense RNA. Within that is contained, a or uh, around that is a capsid. It's the protein shell. Now, Every virus has a capsid, and every virus has its DNA or RNA, its genome. There are extra things as well. Almost all of them are going to have extra proteins inside of them. Uh, they're usually enzymes that serve at least one function, but usually they're multifunctional because viruses are so small genome-wise that they're very, very efficient. A lot of viruses that infect higher order organisms like animals, um, well, I guess that's what I'm thinking of, or mammals, they will have a phospholipid bilayer on their outer surface. That's called an envelope. So that's on top of the actual capsid itself. Not all viruses have phospholipid bilayers. I mentioned before that plant viruses typically don't have phospholipid bilayers because they don't need them. Plants don't have an outer phospholipid bilayer. They have their inner phospholipid bilayer and then their cell wall on the outside. So you need to get through that cell wall, and so they don't need it, viruses. They're super diverse. So I like this picture a lot because it shows uh, some of the sizes. So rhinoviruses, uh, named after your nose, a typical, just common cold kind of virus. HIV is pretty small. And then here's a couple of the huge giant ones. So they can get as big, pethoviruses at least, they can get almost as big as an E. coli, which is crazy. That's so big. But they're not very successful viruses probably because they're just so big and they, I don't know, they just don't infect super well. Um, but I mean, they're still around though, so they must be at least mildly successful. Viruses vary a lot in how big their genome is as well, or at least how we organize their genomes. So how many genes do they actually have? Some of them have massive genomes, uh, like these giant ones. They have a ton of proteins that they need to make. HIV only really has nine genes. Now that's sort of a misnomer because, um, they serve multiple functions. So just saying, oh, I have only nine genes doesn't mean you only have nine functions. You can have dozens or hundreds of functions within there uh, because it's uh, over time they've evolved these ways of uh, being super efficient and doing multiple things, which I mentioned before. Uh, anyway, so, but compared to humans and even bacteria, there's way less genes usually, unless you're getting into those kind of weird ones. Uh, so, but usually we're not talking about those. Oh, hang on text box behind there. Uh, there's still a little text there. So just to show you some of the diversity, we're not going to dig deep into the specific structures of every single virus type. 
the previous virology class, um, not at this school, but when I was in grad school, I was a teaching assistant for an undergraduate virology course. And they were very into, um, it was kind of old school the way it was taught. It was very like memorize every family of viruses, which there's a lot, um, the basics of all of them, which can be helpful, but I've actually found over time that it's not super helpful for students to just memorize all this stuff. It's more helpful to actually just get some of the bigger ideas, which, I mean, that's just kind of how I run education in general in my world. Oh, so you're welcome, because it's usually a little easier. But I want to teach you to think. But I want you to look at these virus structures and just look at them. See what's common and what's not. So in this case, our phospholipid bilayer is in blue. Um, and then a lot of the spike proteins are just multicolored. So yellow is their typical spike protein color. Um, we say spike because they stick off that uh, fossil, the bilayer here. So they just colored a lot of these structures. This is uh, from Viral Zone, which is our, basically our textbook for this class. Um, we say spike, it's just the surface proteins. I don't actually like that term that much because it just simplifies. Everybody says, oh, the spike protein. It's not that simple. Um, but hey, we got to have something to call it. Uh, look at the structures, the variety of structure, a lot of circular structures, which makes sense because the viruses are usually in fluids and that's the natural shape they're going to take, unless they have proteins to give them a different structure. So uh, rhabdoviruses, which rabies is a rhabdovirus, uh, they have like a bullet shape, which is kind of cool. Uh, variola, uh, I don't remember why they have this structure, but they just have kind of a strange structure, a lot bigger too, but most of these are relatively circular. Um, some of these do not have envelopes. So like adenoviruses don't have envelopes, they're non envelope viruses. And so they're just a capsid with lots of capsid proteins, incredibly complex. Don't uh, confuse the lack of a fossil bilayer for being not as complex. Um, you could argue that they're more complex. They can survive longer on surfaces. Generally envelope viruses, like this coronavirus now we're learning, um, envelope viruses, they have an envelope. It's a fossil bilayer. It's very, very susceptible to detergents to drying out, uh, to UV light, uh, which I guess that would cause engender mutations in the virus. But um, honestly, most viruses just being outside dries them up real fast. That's usually, desiccation is a huge problem for fossil bilayers, but that's their weak point. Uh, the non-enveloped viruses, or naked sometimes as they're called, uh, they don't really suffer from those problems as much. Uh, and they can get really small, parvo, as a big problem uh, for uh, humans can get parvoviruses too, but uh, puppy parvo is a common one. So let's just look at virus structures. Uh, I mean, we just looked at some more complex ones, but all viruses have a genome, okay? either DNA or RNA. It can be single-stranded, double-stranded. Uh, they've got a capsid. So in this case, it's this nice purple thing. Uh, the way I talk about it is uh, the genome is like the chocolate and the uh, capsid is like the outer shell of an M&M. And if you could take that whole thing and put it inside of like a gummy, then that would be your fossil of a bilayer. It's squishy outside. Um, they can have different structures, of course, but for the most part, most viruses fall under this category. They have a genome, a capsid, and an envelope. Uh, different proteins will be embedded in the envelope and those provide for the tropism or the ability of the virus to actually enter a host cell. It's going to depend what cells the virus can get into depends on those spike proteins. So some viruses have very broad tropism for um, different cell types. So, um, uh, and some have very narrow. So influenza, for instance, can affect uh, respiratory epithelial cells. It can get uh, lots of epithelials, but various epithelials throughout like the entire upper respiratory tract. HIV, not so much. It only really likes to infect T helper cells and macrophages which you'll hear it tossed around like, oh, they infect T helper cells, but the macrophages are actually a large number of the cells that get infected by HIV too. Uh, but just nobody talks about that. HIV also, sorry. Because um, HIV too is a type of virus. Um, viruses, uh, this is another picture I like a lot just because it's a nice comparison showing uh, a naked virus or a non-enveloped virus with an enveloped one and just that consistency between these two capsids is what I like. Uh, you can also have uh, helical capsids or nucleocapsids. Um, some viruses, they're saying nucleocapsid. There's matrices and there's capsid and nucleocapsid and 
there's a lot of proteins that can provide that structure. And so what you start running into is, um, it's like anything you can actually, there could be like 10 different structural proteins, but we all call them in general, part of the capsid protein structure, but there could be the capsid proteins that are associated with the nuclear material. And then there's the outer capsid proteins. And so those can each get different names. Um, so hence nucleo capsid, the nuclear material or the matrix protein, which is like still, I would argue part of the capsid, but it's sort of combining the, uh, bridging the gap between the capsid and the envelope. So, you know, uh, just terms. Um, the helical version that they're talking about here is more like Ebola viruses here or tobacco mosaic viruses, which aren't on here. Um, but uh, I think I actually have a picture on the next one. Yeah. Uh, oh man, that quality is really low. I'm so sorry. Let's uh, shrink it down just so the quality is not as obvious. Uh, but here's a tobacco mosaic with that helical structure. There's a non-enveloped adenovirus, uh, which will come up later. Uh, we often use adenoviruses. They can cause colds and stuff like that, but we use them uh, very often as vectors, um, a way to deliver genetic material. And then some viruses, uh, <laughs> influenza doesn't actually look like that, um, but <laughs> they have that nice envelope, which is what this is really trying to emphasize. Um, and then bacteriophages fall into a couple categories. Most people think bacteriophages look just like little spider things. They don't all look like that. There can be bacteriophages that look kind of like this uh, with a circular structure or an icosahedral structure, really. Um, but uh, hey, the spider ones look really cool. So. Talking about viral life cycles is really important. They're pretty straightforward in <laughs> at the beginning, but as we dig deeper into specific viruses, they're going to get real complex really fast. Uh, but the basic virus life cycle is always the same. They have to get in, they have to take over, and they have to get back out. Within that, there's a lot of different steps. So I like the Khan Academy version here. So a virus needs to attach. It needs to actually enter. So those are two different steps, right? Actually binding with those spike proteins to a surface receptor is really important. And that establishes the cellular tropism for the virus. Once it actually gets pulled into the cell, lots of different things can happen. Uh, that's endocytosis, and there's a ton of different endocytic pathways, which we'll talk about in a minute. Once it's actually inside the host, it kind of depends on how that virus works to uh, decide what's going to happen. So it needs to take over the cell, basically. Does it need to go to the nucleus? Does it not need to go to the nucleus? Does it need to use a the host's RNA polymerases? Does it not need to use them? Does it need to use any DNA polymerases? Uh -huh. It definitely has to use ribosomes. So that's one thing that we know. Viruses don't bring their own ribosomes with them. They have to take over to use those. Uh, but usually they do that by just making sure that their RNA looks exactly like the host RNA. And so it just gets created. And so that's where our replication step, our gene expression step, where all those viral proteins and new copies of the viral genome are actually getting made then we assemble them. So we need to make our new baby viruses that we're going to then release out of the cell. Um, so that exocytic pathway is also important. We'll, I'll show you some more pictures of that. Um, but actual assembly is really interesting and really complicated. Uh, what you're going to find in this class is that there's a ton of stuff we don't know about how viruses actually work, uh, which is great if you want to go to grad school and study this stuff. So I wanted to use our textbook I'm not going to have a formal textbook for this class. We're going to have an informal one, but it's actually, I would argue, better than any paper textbook could possibly be because it's constantly updated and it's really good. So we're going to use the viral zone, which sounds super dorky, but it's awesome. Um, it's basically just run by virologists and it's kind of old school, uh, but it's really, really good. So what I thought I'd do uh, is uh, oh, let's see, how do I get this up? So uh, this is the link that I put right there. Uh, this is just viral zones, basics for virology. So just basic viral molecular biology, which is what we're talking about. Here's how a virus got to get in, do its thing and get out. Basic. Uh, that's for eukaryotes. Uh, we're going to focus mostly on eukaryotic viruses in this class, though we are going to have one whole week devoted to bacterial 
uh, uh, bacteriophages, which, so what I really like about this website is almost everything is clickable. So I can click on this and it takes me right to this page that talks about just basic bacteriophage infection. Um, what's really nice here too, here's a gram positive infection versus a gram negative infection. They can be kind of different. Gram positives, we know have a super thick gram uh, peptidoglycan layer, whereas gram negatives, it's not as thick, but they have other things on the surface. So it's just uh, really interesting, tons of information here. You can see it, it feels like the quality of the, the pictures and stuff isn't as high as other places, but it's actually the detail is really, really good. That's what I like a lot. I'm gonna skip over uh, the virion portion here. You can go here, it's just uh, clickable links for different types of virion symmetries. Uh, there are a lot of groups that study, uh, they're more physicists than virologists, and they actually study structures of different capsid proteins. Um, so uh, there's a lot of math involved with actually studying these basically tessellated patterns that form different viral particles. So just remember that a virus is this uh, basically non-living, it kind of depends on who you ask, but basically a non-living creature, uh, that doesn't really make sense, that has to establish these incredibly complex structures. Um, it's kind of fascinating and you can fall down the hole real fast of uh, the T I think basically stands for like how many um, uh, pattern pieces there are um, that fit together. So the simplest being T1, you know, like, but you can get really complicated. So uh, if you have a T of 27, you can see there's 27 different uh, facets that have to actually come together. I'm not saying that right. Um, oh, it's, oh, it's 27 different proteins that form the different facets, but the more proteins you have, the more complex the facets. Oh man, it's a whole world that I am not super familiar with, but hey. So what I did want to talk about very briefly is uh, going here. So um, that link will take you here. And then you can click over here on the right and go to virus entry. So we know viruses have to get in, do their thing, and then get back out. And so dealing with all of those, uh, at the top here, you can click on different things. So right now we're in eukaryotes, which we're lumping vertebrates and invertebrates together. Uh, you can click on plants, takes you to a different picture. Uh, you can see very detailed, uh, very well done. Or you can click over here on bacteria. Archaea are actually poorly understood. Um, now what's really cool here, so let's go back to vertebrates. So we're on viral entry. So these are all the different ways that different viruses can actually enter a host cell, which is fascinating. Look at all the detail here. And these are all clickable links. So let's see, I want to understand more about how, I heard that there's this one virus that uses clathrin coated pits to actually enter an endocytos. So let's see here, we've got endocytosis, clathrin, Let's click on it. Oh, here we go. So there's a virus that uses a clathrin coated pit, and here's how it actually is entering the cell and taking over. And then there's more things that I can click on. So how does this uh, virus uh, notice the pH changes in endosomes? And that's actually what causes conformational changes. Uh, if you've taken biochemistry, that will make more sense. If you haven't yet, that's okay. Basically changing the pH can alter uh, the structure of your amino acids depending on whether or not they have uh, hydrogen or not attached, basically. And it causes different uh, uh, protein structural changes. And so as you change your pH, you can change your structure, and then that's gonna change how things actually infect stuff, or how you actually infect the cell. Um, viruses usually depend on endosomal pathways having pH changes. Um, here's another one. So HIV, uh, there's certain strains of HIV that form syncytia, uh, which is, Basically, um, when two, if you have a cell that's infected with a virus, with HIV, um, and it's making baby viruses, and you can imagine all those baby viruses are on the surface. So picture all these baby viruses, they're about to come off, but they haven't yet. And they happen to bump right in next to another cell that's not infected yet, another T helper cell. And so you can imagine those new baby viruses, they haven't become independent yet, and but they can still infect a new host cell. And so they sort of bridge a gap. There's like a little bridge between those. That's called syncytia. And then what happens is those, um, the phospholipid layer of the, the cell membrane for both those cells, the infected one, and then now about to be infected one can combine. And it forms a super cell. It's really weird. 
Um, so certain strains of HIV do that. We used to grow, we used to kind of organize our viruses that way, either syncytial forming or non-syncytial forming. And you'd get these megacells, uh, which have a bunch of nuclei, and they're just <laughs> giant fused cells, which is kind of cool. Um, HIV can do that. Um, one of the most well-known ones is RSV, which little kids get all the time. So that's a respiratory syncytial virus. So it can form syncytia, um, which is kind of cool. But uh, this is just to expose you to the awesome power that this basically textbook is. Um, if you're a virologist, you're going to be coming to the viral zone all the time because it's just, it's the place to go either primary articles or viral zone, because viral zone is going to reference those kinds of things. Now, once we're inside of a cell, okay, so this is gonna teach you all about different ways to actually enter a cell, which is cool. But once you're inside a cell, you need to do stuff. And so um, what I'm about to talk about is the different types of genomes and the different ways that those interact with the host. Now, it's really complicated. These are all things that um, typically what you would do is you would find an area that you're interested in and kind of dig deeper there. So maybe I want to study um, the replication events of, uh, so I'm going to go along here. We haven't talked about this. I'm about to, of the different types of DNA. So I, I mentioned it, I guess. So single-stranded DNA, double-stranded DNA, a double-stranded DNA, uh, reverse transcriptase is what that's saying, single-stranded RNA, um, plus sense or negative sense. There's double-stranded RNA. Uh, there's circularized single-stranded RNA, which is weird. Um, let me jump to uh, just, since we're talking about it, um, the way we organize viruses, uh, one of the ways, uh, a simplified categorization is called the Baltimore classification, named after David Baltimore, who's a virologist. Um, uh, we may end up watching a video of his later. Um, he's still alive. Um, we take, uh, we just organize. So if it's double-stranded DNA, that's group one. Uh, group one, because, I don't know, that's the simplest, double-stranded DNA is just like the simplest way that organisms have genomes. And then group two is single-stranded DNA, group three is double-stranded RNA, and so on. And as we progress down, we just name it. So you can tell someone at a conference, I discovered this new group five uh, Baltimore classified virus. And they'd be like, oh, okay, so it has negative sense RNA, which we need to talk about what that really means. Uh, so that's that's that. Um, <laughs> now that you've seen that, so here, this actually makes sense. So that's where, why they're organized this way. And then we can slide down. Let's say, I want to study double-stranded DNA and how it uh, can form a rolling circle. Oh my goodness. So certain, uh, <laughs> this is getting into the incredible complexity that viruses can use inside of a cell. Um, <laughs> of course, there's a spell here. Um, so I'm not an expert on rolling circle application. I remember studying it a little bit in grad school, uh, but it's basically like the physical way that a virus replicates can vary. And then some viral cases, it can use a, a rolling circle. So like it kind of travels along in a circular pattern along its DNA to actually generate new pieces of DNA, which it kind of makes sense. They, it feels like they should all do that, but they don't. Um, uh, how about bidirectional replication? That's probably a little easier. This looks more like uh, typical like bacterial growth. Uh, anyway, but those are all in double-stranded DNA. So let's try another one. Let's try uh, how does um, double-stranded RNA replicate? Well, let's click on it and learn. And there's a nice little picture. So it gets in, uh, we assemble, we uh, synthesize, we make new babies, and then we send them out. So it's actually not that exciting. Uh, how about, ooh, here we go, single-stranded negative sense RNA. How it does it get replicated? Ah, much more complicated. So we've got our negative sense, which we convert to a positive sense. And then eventually we're going to have to convert back to a negative sense. So we actually need to talk about viral sense and what that actually means. So you'll notice here we've got double-stranded DNA, uh, double-stranded uh, double RNA here, and then there's single-stranded RNA plus, that means positive sense, and then we've got single-strand RNA here, which is negative sense. And there's obviously a lot of uh, differences between the two. So viruses can fall into a couple different categories. So single-stranded RNA viruses, they're either plus or negative sense. Plus-stranded RNA looks exactly like messenger RNA. 
So normally we have our, in your cells, you have your DNA and we make messenger RNA from that. And then we send that to a ribosome and it gets turned into a protein, right? Well, viruses can do weird stuff. So if it's positive sense RNA, it looks exactly like a messenger RNA, you can just send it right to a ribosome and it'll make a protein. Some viruses kind of go backwards. They start with the complementary copy of that RNA, which then has to be made to a positive sense RNA and then sent to the ribosome. So that's kind of weird, that's a, that extra step. So some of them start out negative sense, single-stranded RNA. They have to use an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to make it the complementary copy, and then that looks just like messenger RNA and they can send it to be made. Now what gets kind of tricky is that there's viruses that both the negative sense and the positive sense of their RNA genome can code for proteins. So you're like, well, then this is kind of positive, but this is negative still, I don't know. It gets complicated. There's advantages and disadvantages. Mostly we just say like, okay, what is its base genome? Is it negative sense or positive sense for the most part? And that's how we categorize them, uh, basically into uh, group five or uh, group four. Sorry, so group four is positive sense, group five is negative sense. But you'll see sometimes positive sense has to actually be converted to negative sense before you can make the complementary copy of that, which is the positive sense. Oh man, it gets complicated. But it's okay. It's not that scary. There's advantages and disadvantages to both. Uh, I actually did some digging because um, you would argue, why would you start out with a negative sense RNA? Uh, that seems less efficient to be required to bring your own RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Uh, that's a whole extra step, a whole extra set of proteins, a whole extra chunk of space in your genome that gets taken up. Why would you do that? That seems uh, evolutionarily inefficient. But there are some advantages. Uh, it's honestly, it's kind of up for debate uh, what people think. Uh, but those, <laughs> in the end, those viruses still exist and they're still very successful. So there must be some reason, uh, some advantage that they have, um, or they're just kind of stuck that way and it's good enough. Sometimes that's just how things work. Uh, so let's just jump back here. So. Uh, that's where these come from. So if you want to learn all about all kinds of ways, leaky scanning, I don't even know what that is. Uh, I've never heard of that. But it sounds like something to engender uh, maybe mutations in. Leaky scanning is a phenomenon in which a weak initiation codon triplet in on messenger RNA is sometimes skipped by ribosome in translation initiation. Ah, interesting. So I'm assuming that is allowing... Um, so what some viruses will do is they will have, instead of a segmented genome, so some viruses will have, um, like influenza is a great example. Uh, let me come up here. So they're showing uh, each of these is a segment. Uh, let me actually back up here. Let's go to here. So when we talked about genetic drift and genetic shift, influenza has eight genome segments. It's a segmented virus. Each of those RNA genomes is its own independent thing. That's why it's so easy to swap them. Okay. Other viruses are not like that. So I know that rhabdoviruses have one continuous genome, and that it, so it's non-segmented. So you actually have to cut it to get it into its, the correct, uh, into its independent little RNA pieces that then can be translated. And so, um, let me go back. Uh, so what you start running into is, uh, let's go back to leaky scanning. Um, if it's non-segmented, then you might have one big long RNA, and if you can get it to, uh, it, let's say it starts at uh, the, right at the beginning and makes a protein, okay, awesome. But maybe sometimes the ribosome skips and jumps to, it jumps over like that first chunk that would, so let's say you have one giant long RNA that makes 10 different proteins. Well, if you start right at the beginning, you make protein one, protein two, protein three, protein four, but sometimes you can skip ahead and start making protein two, just skip protein one altogether. And it looks like that's what they mean by leaky scanning. Um, not having really prepped to talk about leaky scanning. Anyway, so really complex, really cool stuff. Uh, if it if it's lighting your fire, then go for it. Um, I like this a lot too. Uh, we're gonna spend some time talking, I'm not gonna spend too much time right now. Um, the different ways that cells fight off viruses is really, really interesting. Uh, we've been in a constant evolutionary struggle with viruses for however long you think humans have been alive. And so we've developed really good ways of fighting back, but they've also evolved ways of fighting those fights. And so things get really complex 
And it's kind of cool. That's a little more in my world. I like that a lot, the immune system and how we actually deal with viruses. Now, viruses have to get in, they have to take over, and then they have to get out. And how viruses actually exit, so here's the bottom, uh, like the nucleus in the cell, and we're actually heading out. There's lots of different ways. So they could leave by syncytia, like I talked about earlier, or um, they can bud out um, either with escort or without escort, which is just a protein complex. So with escort, uh, you can see it's kind of complex. Uh, there's uh, Usually it's just what kind of protein is allowing them to leave. So there's the escort protein, which uses a couple different proteins. and Basically, it's sealing off that gap. Um, a lot of times we oversimplify things. We just say like, all right, the, the virus uh, buds off or blebs off is another term I've heard before. Think about all that has to happen. There's tons of proteins associated with, uh, basically the inside of a cell is chock full of proteins that need to interact, tons of different ones. So this one, some viruses will use the escort complex to do that. Um, some can do non-escort based complex, but they're just using different proteins. So I, I would argue like, well, I, it's not an argument, they're just using different proteins, but most of them, I think, actually use the escort if they use budding. Uh, the lytic pathway is actually not as common. Uh, I guess we don't even have a picture. Uh, some viruses uh, enjoy destroying cells via lysis, uh, but a lot of them, um, that's not the most effective way. Um, a, a, a virus, if it takes over a cell, one of the better things to do is to slowly take it over. You're making tons of babies, but if you if you destroy your virus factory too fast, then you're not going to actually make as many babies. So if you swell and explode, which is the lytic pathway, um, sometimes uh, bacteriophages will do that. Uh, but in uh, mammalian cells and uh, invertebrates and invertebrates and eukaryotes, uh, that's not as common to just destroy the cell. Yes, the cell will eventually die, but it's not necessarily by lysis, though it is lysing. Um, it's not the lytic pathway, is what I'm trying to say. Anyway, I kind of want to click on syncytia and see. Oh, it's just the same picture. Um, so, anywho, uh, act and transport too. That's kind of cool. Like, how does a virus that is assembled in the nucleus or outside the nucleus actually going to follow um, uh, use actin to propel, propel itself? Uh, if you've taken cell biology, we actually uh, with me, we've actually studied this in one of the videos. Um, they build uh, viruses and some bacteria can actually move through the cell almost using um, actin, which is the protein for the cell cell, cell skeleton. Um, they will form new actin chains here and break them down here. And that the physical formation of those actin, um, like joining them to this chain, will propel it forward. It's super, super interesting. Um, I have some cool uh, pictures of that actually happening inside of cell. Anyway, it looks like they're kind of like skating through the cell. Super cool stuff. Anywho, all kinds of things that we can talk about. Uh, almost done here. Viral growth phases. Viruses follow a typical um, living organism growth phase. So you have that initial inoculation. Um, then there, it takes some time for the virus to take over. You have that burst as viruses start releasing um, uh, progeny and then uh, eventually you're uh, so imagine there's like a hundred cells that get infected takes a little while um, they're ma they're all making babies some half the cells start dying and so you, you start losing the number of virions that actually gets uh, released um, but uh, a typical growth phase bacteria follow similar growth phases and there would be a drop off here uh, so there would be a a death phase because uh, there's what lag log uh, equilibrium and then death phases. The last thing I want to talk about <laughs> is where do viruses come from? Now we're going to talk about viral evolution, uh, specifically uh, influenza and how, uh, or coronavirus even, uh, we'll talk about um, how new viruses evolve. But where did the original virus come from? That's a great question. So this um, article down here from Nature is pretty good in talking about the different theories, uh, but I'm just going to summarize it for you here. Um, uh, this blog as well is another good resource. Um, it's actually not, <laughs> they're not the most exciting things to read about because there's no hard answers. There's basically three hypotheses uh, that are probably improvable. Um, so either the <laughs> viruses came from the host. So we do know that there are genetic elements that can move inside of higher order organisms. They can, and so 
uh, the guesstimate, the hypothesis is that one of those just somehow learned how to be independent and then that's where viruses came from. Um, or they could be leftovers. So uh, the way the regressive hypothesis is in my head is that um, there's like a piece, uh, like a bacteria that just started losing pieces. Like, ah, I don't need that part and I don't need that part. And it gets reduced so much that it's just the absolute bare minimum left over from some kind of bacteria that just, it's the bare minimum. It does, it has a, an envelope and a protein and it just has to take over other cells. Um, I don't really like that one that much. I don't know. Uh, but then there's the virus first, which just says that viruses like evolved first and then out of those came more complex cells. So like we're descended from viruses, I guess would be the most generic way to accept that. Um, do I believe in any of these? I, I don't know. I don't really care. Uh, it's argued that there's probably all of them may have happened in some way, shape, or form, or they just exist and they're just things. Um, this diagram sort of explains that. Um, it's a little confusing, but either viruses came from the cells or cells came from the virus. I think this is not talking about that, but anyway. So uh, in the set of papers for this week, I also included, uh, so there's a nice review article about this kind of history. Uh, that's very helpful. Uh, there's also a review article that talks about um, some of the basics of viral entry, I believe from an HIV perspective. Uh, no, it's generic viruses. It's just a viral entry. Uh, but I also found two uh, diagrams. I actually used them to help do this presentation. Um, so I, I have them in this PowerPoint, but they're attached as uh, PDFs and one's a JPEG uh, in that um, zip file for this uh, module of the class. Um, they're really, really cool. Um, shout outs to the authors. Uh, they're, at, they're at the bottoms of the pictures. Uh, but a history of all the pandemics that have affected uh, some of the big ones that have affected humans. You can see like I hit most of these um, and their death toll and stuff. And that is from um, Visual Capitalist. They just took it from a bunch of places. Um, and then this one from R&D Systems uh, is really, really cool. It's uh, I have a, the, a higher quality one for you guys. Uh, it's uh, a history of virology. The important things uh, a lot of vaccine stuff um, i got most of my um, dates and facts uh, but you can see i skipped over a ton of them uh, and this one's really really nice and you can actually order a uh, copy of it uh, which i did so you can go to their website uh, which is um, what did i say rd which is a big research group anyway so that is viral history and basics yeah